Tonight, breaking news, wildfires explode. The massive blaze raging in California. The state's largest fire spreading rapidly, fully engulfing homes and triggering gas line explosions. Thousands forced to evacuate as the wildfire closes in on Yosemite National Park. Crews working in sweltering temperatures to put out the flames. Miguel Almaguer on the front lines of that fire tonight. Also breaking the shooting at Dallas Love Field Airport. A woman pulling out a gun and firing multiple rounds at the check-in line. Panic passengers sheltering in place. How police were able to take the suspect down and what they say she did moments before pulling the trigger. DNA test warning, the lawmakers sounding the alarm, cautioning that those popular services used to trace your family tree could be used to develop biological weapons, which you need to know to keep your genetic information safe. Also tonight, the disturbing video showing a pedestrian hit by a car in New York City, the driver and passengers then getting out, not to help him, but to rob him. The urgent manhunt for those suspects now underway. Plus, trapped in a sandstorm, the enormous dust cloud blocking out the sky, leaving hundreds stranded. And rumor has it Adele is heading back to Vegas. The pop superstar announcing new concert dates after postponing her residency earlier this year. But will fans still be excited to say hello the second time around? Top Story starts right now. And good evening, California on fire. The state's largest blaze so far this year, scorching miles of land as it barrels towards Yosemite. Take a look, the fiery explosion caught on camera as flames tear through homes in Mariposa County. The Oak Fire forcing more than 3,000 residents to evacuate. The wildfire spreading at what crews have called an unprecedented speed. Just 60 acres of land burned on Friday, and now more than 16,000 acres scorched. At least 2,000 firefighters battling this blaze right now. Many battling triple-digit temperatures on the ground as well. The fire just 10% contained. The trail of destruction so huge, it can be seen from hundreds of miles above. This massive plume of smoke captured from the International Space Station. The unpredictable fire now closing in on Yosemite National Park, which you'll remember already burned earlier in the year. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is on the front lines and leads us off tonight. This is what California's wildfire season looks and sounds like now. Exploding into the largest inferno in the state this year, the Oak Fire burning near Yosemite is also the most volatile blaze of the season, torching everything in its path. I appreciate how everybody's sticking together. It's okay. No, it's okay. I still haven't absorbed this. Even with 2,000 firefighters on the ground, the Oak Fire is raging out of control, destroying at least 10 structures, including newlywed Steve and Andrea Ward's home, which erupted into a fireball. She's looking over my, my shoulder and, you know, this home that we had just gotten married at two weeks ago, it, it explodes. With 3,000 people forced to evacuate, 3,200 structures still lie in the path of the fire. As the blaze breaks off and moves in multiple directions, firefighters are having a tough time staying in front of it. So now they're using the help of the air attack. There. But even a steady line of fire retardant isn't stopping the blaze. Visible from outer space, the suffocating blanket of smoke has now drifted hundreds of miles, choking the skies near the Bay Area. It comes amid deadly temperatures blanketing the country, 37 million under heat alerts. But it's the Pacific Northwest that could see temperatures rise as high as 115 degrees. Back on the fire line, some good news. The inferno is moving towards burn scars like these, where there's little fuel for flames. You know, it's just stuff, is the thing. It's just stuff, but it's still amazing to see what survives. For some, the damage is already done. California's most destructive fire of the year certainly won't be the last. <laughs> All right, Miguel Almaguer joins us now from the footprint of the fire in Mariposa, California. Miguel, have the fire crews made any progress today? 
Well, Tom, crews are making progress. This blaze is roughly 10% contained, but you can see in this neighborhood, which it blew through in a matter of minutes, it just incinerated everything in its path. We're told this house and the car here in front of me literally went up in smoke and up in flames in a matter of minutes. That's how destructive this fire was. For many people who live in this area, they don't have fire insurance. They'll likely never return here again. Tom? Yeah, you can see just how powerful that fire is. It looks like the destruction is completely 360 degrees around you. What are the weather conditions like out there today? It looked like, like wind might have been a factor. Yeah, Tom, winds are always a factor in these wildfires, but right now winds have slowed down, so that's working in their favor. Unfortunately, it's in the mid-90s out here. That's slowing down exhausted firefighters who are doing that back-breaking work of digging trenches on the front lines. So they've got some good news and some bad news on the weather front. Of course, the next 24 hours will be critical. Tom? All right, Miguel Almaguer and, and his team on the front lines there of that fire. Miguel, we thank you. As the Oak Fire continues to burn out of control, thousands of Californians are being forced to evacuate. Among those facing the uncertainty of the wildfire, the camp counselors of Camp Creme, a program for children with developmental disabilities. Jenny Codra joins us now. She's the program director for Camp Creb. First, Jenny, the camp staff had to evacuate the Yosemite location, and it was the first year, I understand, you guys were there because of your Boulder Creek location was damaged in the Cizu Lightning Fire Complex in, in 2020. What's it like for you and the other staff to have to go through this again? Yeah, it's never easy having to evacuate, but... We've been reviewing our protocols and have been prepared doing regular fire drills in case this came to it. Um, and our staff did an amazing job responding quickly and efficiently and worked really well together. Um, and we're so grateful to the community here, especially Camp Harmon and the Boulder Creek and Ben Loman fire departments for their outpouring of support. What was it, what was it like evacuating the children as well? Well, fortunately, we didn't have any campers with us during this time, um, but we would have been really prepared if, if need be. As I mentioned, your camp works with children with a wide range of disabilities. Going to camp can be a life-changing experience for those kids. And now the staff has been evacuated and the future sessions have, canceled, have been canceled. What have you heard from the campers and their families? You know, the campers and their families are so supportive of us and um, just really thankful that we're safe. Um, obviously, it's really sad for our campers and their families and losing Camp Crime in the CZU fire um, was a big loss to so many. So we're all just really hoping that Camp Crime Yosemite, our new camp, uh, survives and that we can go back there really soon. You know, we're, we're only about halfway through this wildfire season, which typically goes until October. It's now been extended into December. Are you worried how this fire is going to sort of, I don't know, harm the future of your camp going forward? Of course, I mean, fire is, it's not predictable. Um, we're just really hopeful that it does get contained soon um, and that we will be able to have future sessions back at camp. Jenny Kadra, camp counselor who had to evacuate because of that massive fire. Jenny, we thank you for joining Top Story tonight. And those wildfires partially fueled by record heat impacting much of the country. So I wanna bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman to see if any relief is on the way. Michelle, walk us through the next several days. Hey there, Tom. Well, unfortunately, in the Pacific Northwest, we are just getting started with the triple digits, upper 90s in a lot of spots. So we continue to watch the Oak Fire burning, and it's only going to get worse over the next couple of days. Let's take a look at the latest, because we're only at 10 percent containment. We're looking at more than 16,000 acres burned, and it's being fueled by this extreme heat, sunshine, dry brush, and those conditions are going to linger. We're not even through the wildfire season. As we go throughout the next couple of days, the smoke will impact California, also Oregon. We're going to start to see the winds picking up tomorrow night to breezy, not all that high, but still blowing that wind into Oregon and also parts of Washington. There's a look at that extreme heat. We have 37 million Americans under a heat advisory, heat watch or heat warning. Where you see the Pacific Northwest, we're looking at a heat watch, also heat warning from Seattle, Portland, down to Medford. That is going to add fuel to the fire, quite literally. So as we look at the temperatures tomorrow, we are looking at the triple digits in Medford, 108 degrees tomorrow, 100 degrees in Salt Lake City. Still so warm in Joplin, Dallas, and the triple digits. We're also looking at temperatures in the 90s. That heat is going to linger into the Pacific Northwest as we go throughout uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Look at those triple digits in Medford, 109 by Thursday, 106 by Friday. Also seeing triple digits in Burns and also Boise. 
finally seeing some relief in the Northeast. We have a cold front that's moving through. That's bringing some storms, but also will bring some relief by tomorrow. So temperatures feeling so good in Pittsburgh, 78 degrees, 77 in Portland, New York City, 85 degrees. But that relief is short-lived. We're back to the 90s by Thursday and also the upper 80s by Friday. Tom? All right, Michelle, we thank you for that. Next tonight to the other breaking news story, we're following the chaotic scene at a Dallas airport. A woman shot by police after opening fire near a ticket counter. The airport packed with summer travelers who were forced to hide from the gunshots. Priscilla Thompson is at the scene with the latest. Tonight, an active shooter taken down at the Dallas Love Field Airport. Fearful travelers rushed outside to the tarmac during the incident, while others sheltered in place. A couple of us ducked under kind of a cash register wrap kind of, kind of station for a few minutes. Attention all units responding to the gunshot at 8008 Curb Killer. Everyone can enter the shooter is down. Police say a 37-year-old woman was dropped off near the Southwest ticket counters around 11 a.m., then went into a bathroom and left wearing different clothes. At some point, simultaneously, one of our officers is in the area. She produces a handgun and begins firing. At this point, we don't know where exactly the individual was aiming. For the most of what we're seeing now, she was aiming uh, at the ceiling. They say the woman was confronted and shot below the waist by an officer on scene. She was then taken into custody and is currently at a local hospital. Police say no one else was injured, though they found several rounds on site. Our NBC affiliate spoke with an eyewitness who says he saw the woman come in and say she had an announcement to make. She basically said her announcement, talk about her husband was cheating or something. And she basically said she was about to blow the sucker up. And after she said that, she pulled out a gun. She fired the first shot in the air, and basically everybody scattered. Police have not confirmed all the details of his account. Southwest Airlines paused all departures and arrivals, writing in part, there's no greater priority for us than the safety of our employees and customers, all of which are reportedly safe. Well, that was pretty spooky, but... I think we're all good. TSA tweeted they would have to evacuate all travelers from terminals and rescreen everyone. Everybody's rescheduling their flights, and half the people at the bar are just like, screw it, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going home. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins us now live from Dallas Love Field Airport. Quite a scene there today. Priscilla, have police given any update on the shooter? Yeah, Tom, police have identified the shooter as 37-year-old Portia Odafua. Uh, we did a public records request uh, or search, which shows that there are some previous arrests there. But we're also seeing reports that there may be some mental health uh, concerns there. But she is in custody as police and the FBI continue to investigate. Tom? And then, and then we, we see the police cars there behind you. Is the airport still backed up with security concerns? Uh, there's definitely a heightened law enforcement presence here. There are still some areas that are blocked off inside, but things do appear to be moving again. Of course, this after 200 plus cancellations and more than 900 delays. But I have seen some planes taking off. So uh, a glimmer of hope as folks try to get that travel back on track today, Tom. OK, Priscilla Thompson with those new developments tonight. Priscilla, thank you for that. We move on now to Washington, where President Biden continues to recover from COVID-19. The 79-year-old's doctor saying his COVID symptoms are pretty much resolved. The president still in isolation tonight and is now taking aim at his predecessor as new details emerge from the January 6th investigation. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. President Biden tonight on the back end of his bout with COVID. I'm feeling good. My voice is still raspy. Uh, I've had every morning, <laughs> every afternoon, I mean, excuse me, every evening I get a full-blown series of tests. His doctor writing that his symptoms have almost completely resolved. The president saying he hopes to return to work in person by the end of this week. It comes as his predecessor, former President Trump, is set to return to Washington tomorrow for the first time since he left the White House. Today, a member of the January 6th committee releasing new evidence showing Mr. Trump resisted some of the sharpest criticism in a draft of the remarks he was to give the day after the attack, including crossing out lines calling for the rioters to be prosecuted. Do you recognize the handwriting? 
it looks like my father's handwriting. The committee says Mr. Trump deleted a key graph that read, I am directing the Department of Justice to ensure all lawbreakers are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. We must send a clear message, not with mercy, but with justice. Legal consequences must be swift and firm. Do you know why he wanted that crossed out? Uh, I don't know. Mr. Trump did still criticize the rioters in his speech. And to those who broke the law, you will pay. President Biden tonight, in a speech to black law enforcement executives, slamming Mr. Trump's inaction on January 6th. The police were heroes that day. Donald Trump lacked the courage to act. You can't be pro-insurrection and pro-cop. All right, Peter joins us now from the White House. Peter, I know you have some new reporting about another high-ranking former Trump official who's testified to the grand jury investigating the January 6th attack. Walk our viewers through why this is so significant. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. It's Mark Short. He is the former chief of staff to the former vice president, Mike Pence, who NBC News has now confirmed testified under subpoena last Friday here before that Washington, D.C. grand jury that is investigating the events surrounding the Capitol attack. It would also be an indication that the Department of Justice's investigation has now gone beyond those riders themselves and the fake elector scheme. So it's another piece of information as we watch the way these investigations are developing. Tom. A significant development, no doubt. I do want to go back to the current president while I have you here, Peter. The pres president Biden is 79 years old. His doctors are making yeah. it very clear tonight. He seems to be recovering at a normal pace from COVID, correct? Yeah, it, it appears to be the case. The president himself saying in some of his remarks earlier today, in his words, God willing, he will have a complete and full recovery. And it appears that he's on his way. His own doctor in that letter released uh, today saying that his symptoms are almost completely resolved. The president still with a raspy voice, as he heard, but certainly appears to be in much better spirits, Tom. Okay, Peter Alexander for us tonight. Peter, we thank you. We turn now to the growing health scare. The World Health Organization declaring monkeypox a global health emergency now. It's a rare designation from the WHO with the latest one being the COVID-19 outbreak in January of 2020. NBC's Blaine Alexander has more on the response here at home. As calls to strengthen the nation's monkeypox response grow louder and U.S. cases skyrocket from 1,400 less than two weeks ago to nearly 3,000 today, the World Health Organization has declared the virus a global health emergency. Dr. Jennifer McQuiston is leading the CDC's response. How big is the CDC response to this virus? Right now, we have over 300 people who are working on this response 24-7. Rarely fatal, the virus is marked by painful lesions and sores spread through close physical contact. And while monkeypox is not new, the rapid spread is. What's causing it now to spread in a different way than it has before? We're coming out of COVID, right? It's been two years of people not traveling, not attending parties, not having fun. And I think there's some amplification of this that's happened as a result of people going out, um, living their lives. And that spread, she says, goes beyond just physical contact from respiratory droplets. If somebody has lesions inside their mouth or throat, they could um, potentially shed virus. To sharing things like clothing, towels or blankets with someone with an open sore. The vast majority of cases are spreading among men in the LGBTQ community. How important is it, though, that people outside of that community also don't close their eyes to this virus? That's really important, as we know throughout history that infectious diseases don't stay in only one population. So perhaps it's been magnified early on in this population, but it could potentially spread over into other populations. Two of the latest cases in children. A cornerstone of the CDC's response, more testing and making more vaccines available all while still managing COVID. There are only so many staff members at CDC. So when we stood up the monkeypox response, we had to pull people out of COVID. She says, if you think you've been exposed, isolate, then call a doctor and get tested. We'd like to see the curve not keep going up, but flatten out and then eventually start to go down. So that would be my hope in the next three to six months. And that's realistic if people take precautions now. Yes. And Tom, experts are putting an emphasis on who should be getting that vaccine. They say if you have been exposed or if you're in the population that's at higher risk of getting exposed, you should prioritize getting the shot. Tom. Okay, Blaine, we thank you for that. We want to head overseas now to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Two more Americans killed in battle and a Russian missile striking a key port in Odessa, delaying the transfer of grain to countries in dire need. Morgan Chesky is on the ground tonight for us. In eastern Ukraine tonight, fears frontline fighting, leaving two American families in mourning. 
A Ukrainian commander sharing over the weekend that two Americans, including Luke Lucizan, died in battle after traveling here on the Rhone to join the war effort. My heart can't be any heavier than it is now. Kathy and George Lou Season describing their son Luke as a loving father who went abroad wanting to help and found work as a medic. Every time I talked to him, I, I, I told him, why don't you just come home? The parents say Luke was knocked unconscious by an artillery blast. Then his fellow fighters rushed to help. A Russian tank opened fire. He didn't go there to be a hero. He went, he went there because he wanted to help people. Meanwhile, in the port city of Odessa, smoke filled skies after a Russian missile strike. The attack coming after Russia agreed to end its blockade and allow Ukrainian ships to deliver vital grain, more than 20 million tons at risk of rotting in ships right now. Tonight, Russia's foreign minister says their target was strictly military and the deal is still on. But Ukraine's deputy prime minister, Irina Vedershuk, is doubtful. Do you have any faith that this grain, this food, will make it to these countries who are in dire need. Russia showed to everyone Russia would fire at any corridor at any time whenever it wishes. And tonight, before any ship departs the Odessa port here carrying that vital grain, Ukrainian officials say they must first clear a path through a Black Sea that's currently laden with underwater mines. Tom? OK, Morgan Chesky. Morgan, we thank you for that. A historic apology by Pope Francis in Canada today, asking its indigenous people for forgiveness for what he called the evil committed by so many Christians at Catholic churches run residential schools. And Thompson is in Edmonton tonight. On the Canadian prairie, powerful words from Pope Francis. I am sorry. I ask forgiveness. Francis applauded as he spoke near a former residential school where indigenous children were abused by Catholic priests and nuns. Forced by the government to attend, the children stripped of their cultures and identities, policies the Pope called catastrophic. What's it like to be back here? The memories. There's, uh, there's a lot of little spirits. Josephine Smalls went to the Ermanskin school the Pope visited. The gymnasium is all that remains. And there was a lot of abuse. Smalls was physically and sexually That's abused at the school. Kara um, Curry Hall and Deborah Parker an are daughters of abuse office. victims. Yeah, you, the Pope praying today at the graves of some 6,000 children who died. Our people have called for the releasing of the records and also the repatriation of those babies, bring them home. Ancestors to be remembered even in our interview. Why is that chair here? For the ones that can't be here, for the ones that suffered the most, that still to this day cannot even talk about it. Francis initially apologized at the Vatican in April. Father Susai Jesu was there. What difference does it make that it happens in Canada? People are going to be opening their heart for reconciliation and healing because he is going to be speaking on the soil of this land. Francis welcomed with a headdress today, but not everyone is ready to forgive. Say I'm sorry, but show you're sorry. All right, that was Ann Thompson for us. Still ahead tonight, the hit, rob, and run new surveillance video shows an SUV plowing through a jogger in New York City. But what happens next is even more sickening. Also, the manhunt in Southern California after a deadly shooting inside a crowded park. The police tonight from the LAPD to anyone who was there. And the massive sandstorm consuming a road in China. How the long, how long the wall of dust and sand trapped drivers. Stay with us. We're back now with some troubling video released by the New York Police Department. It's surveillance footage that shows a 39-year-old man being hit by a car and flung across a Bronx street corner. Then those inside that car got out, but they didn't help the man. Instead, they picked his pockets while he was down. We want to warn you, this video, of course, is disturbing. Stephen Robo has more. Tonight, a shocking robbery targeting a car crash victim, all caught on disturbing surveillance video. New York police released this security camera video obtained at the scene in the Bronx. It shows a black sedan appear to swerve and hit the 39-year-old victim as he crossed the street at a crosswalk early Saturday morning. The man was launched into the air by the collision and landed on the sidewalk. He remained there motionless. He's a guy, good guy, good guy. 
I'm so sorry with him. But even more troubling is what police say happened next. Someone from inside that vehicle runs over to the victim and robs him, taking personal property right off of him before they fled in the sedan, according to investigators. It's scary getting on the train. It's scary walking the streets. You know, you don't know what's going to happen out here anymore. But the NYPD says the suspects were not done yet. Seen in video returning just minutes later to check the man's pockets a second time. Police say the suspects then took off in the vehicle used in that crash. The shocking incident comes as New York, like many other cities nationwide, is seeing an increase in crime. According to the NYPD, robberies are up nearly 40% in the five boroughs compared to this time last year, on track to be the worst year for robberies since 2013. Grand Larceny also on the rise, up nearly 50% from 2021. Deadly crimes seem to be trending in a better direction. Murders down 5% and shooting incidents down more than 10% from last year. But they still remain significantly elevated from pre-pandemic lows. As for the Bronx, hit and run turned robbery. The NYPD says the victim suffered significant bodily trauma and is listed in critical condition at Lincoln Hospital. The NYPD released these surveillance images showing the three suspects, but there have been no arrests made in connection with this case. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now live in studio. So, Stephen, this was such a brutal crime. What do we know about the victim? Yeah, we're actually hearing from WNBC that this victim worked in that area at a bodega where he had been for a few years. He was also jogging in the area at the time. This was about 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday, so that would make sense. It's not exactly clear, though, why he was targeted other than the robbery being uh, other than the motive being robbery for this incident, Tom. Okay, Stephen, we thank you for that. We turn now to a wild weekend of sea animal encounters. One woman getting attacked by a seal and others getting dangerously close to a humpback whale. It comes during growing concerns about sharks in the water as well. Kathy Park is at Rockaway Beach in New York, which had to shut down to swimmers this weekend. Tonight, scary moments for boaters, swimmers, and surfers as they get dangerously close to sea life, including sharks, seals, and humpback whales. The latest encounter in Hawaii between a woman and a nursing monk seal. It happened Sunday morning in Waikiki when the woman was swimming close to the seal and her pup in a fenced off area. The attack injured the swimmer, according to Hawaii Marine Animal Response. Are you okay? Did you get bit? The organization says it's been monitoring the monk seal pup, which was born about two weeks ago, and warning people to stay away from protective seal mothers. And across the country, in Plymouth, Massachusetts this weekend, a humpback whale caught on camera breaching the water and landing on a boat. Oh, oh. Authorities reporting there were thankfully no injuries. It all comes amid a slew of shark encounters on both coasts. Oh in Cape Cod, terrifying images, nearly two dozen shark sightings, some just 30 yards from shore. In Alabama and South Carolina, apparent sharks seen swimming just feet from the beach. And in California, surfers getting uncomfortably close to what appears to be a large shark. It's massive. Oh, my God. This following a rash of shark attacks off New York's Long Island. At least six people bitten in the last three weeks alone. We were joking about sharks, actually, and then uh, it got me. 16-year-old Max Haynes was surfing off Fire Island with a friend when he was attacked. Jaws clamping down on his foot, leaving a nasty gash. I felt on my foot like a bear trap just get me from below and it's like hard it felt like it broke my foot experts say the long island shark attacks may be explained by a nursery of sand tiger sharks just off the coast and a large school of bait fish they feed on the sharks mistake the people for uh the food that they're after New York's governor now ramping up the use of drones for shark surveillance. If we have a sighting or a potential sighting, we're able to pop that drone up in just a matter of minutes. While sightings can be scary, experts say in most encounters, sharks often ignore us. But many communities not taking any chances, launching extra measures to make sure it's safe to go in the water. Now, if you want to avoid any sort of scary shark encounter, try not to swim at dusk or dawn, and remember to remove all that jewelry before you hit the water, because sometimes the reflection off that jewelry might mimic fish scales. 
But experts also say that shark attacks are extremely rare. We're just not on their food chain. Tom? Okay, Kathy, thank you. When we come back, the DNA test warning, the congressman now sounding the alarm over the popular product saying private companies can use the data to develop bioweapons that target an individual person. Those details next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the armed robbery of a bishop that was caught on live stream. This is pretty wild. Video shows the moment at least three armed men disrupt the Sunday sermon in Brooklyn. The bishop forced to the ground and stripped of his jewelry. The robbers reportedly made away with more than $400,000 worth of jewels. No injuries were reported, and so far, no arrests have been made. A manhunt is underway, though, in Southern California after a deadly shooting inside a Los Angeles area park. Authorities say gunfire erupted near a baseball game in San Pedro Park. At least two people killed and six others injured. Police say multiple guns were recovered at the scene. The LAPD is asking anyone who was inside the park at the time to help identify the suspects. And an investigation tonight in New York City after a scaffolding collapse. New video from Citizen App shows the pile of debris that crushed at least two cars in Queens. Luckily, no one was injured. No word on the cause yet, but officials say the site's general contractor received multiple citations. And T-Mobile has agreed to pay $350 million to settle multiple class action lawsuits stemming from a data breach. The funds will go towards covering payments to victims as well as legal and administrative fees. Nearly 80 million U.S. residents were affected by the breach that was disclosed last August. T-Mobile says it will also spend $150 million to improve its data security. Okay, over the weekend, a story caught our attention here on Top Story. A member of the House Intelligence Committee is warning Americans not to use DNA testing services. Congressman Jason Crow said this weekend that private companies could use the material to develop bioweapons targeting individuals. The warning something out of the latest James Bond movie where the spy is up against a weapon that can pinpoint DNA and its effects, its chosen targets. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. Ken, this is pretty alarming, and our only point of reference is, is a James Bond film. Is this actually possible, and, and, and how would these weapons work? So, Tom, it, it wasn't known that it was possible, and that's why Jason Crow's comments are getting so much attention, because he serves on the House Intelligence Committee. He has access to classified briefings, and he's saying it is possible. So it's not been demonstrated in science, but... Uh, there's been a lot of study and concern about the idea that the CRISPR gene editing technology makes it much easier to create a targeted bioweapon that could be aimed at a particular ethnic group or a particular sample of the population, people with certain characteristics. That's really scary because it makes a bioweapon sort of more readily uh, effective and such that it's not going to backfire on the people who are using it. Really frightening stuff, Tom. So, Ken, the, the company is like 23andMe. Who, who owns them and, and where are they based? So 23andMe is actually a, an American-owned California company that trades on the NASDAQ, but U.S. officials have said it has a Chinese investor and it hasn't been transparent about exactly what data it shares with that Chinese investor. Now, the 23andMe CEO has said that they do not sell uh, the data that they collect to the government of China. But there's a lot of U.S. officials I talk to that have a lot of questions about that. And it's not just 23andMe. There, there's a Chinese company called BGI that sells a neonatal test called Nifty. It, uh, that you know allows uh, women to get to bypass amniocentesis to test uh, their you know their prospective uh, fetus to see if there are any irregularities. It also gathers their DNA and it doesn't advertise that it's a Chinese company. So there's a lot of sort of there's a lot of trading of data moving around of medical data without a lot of regulation or transparency. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Ken, because I mean, could they sell your information essentially? You sign up for these products, you think they're amazing because you find a long lost cousin, a long lost brother in some cases. But what happens to that information if they're selling it to companies overseas, if they are? Well, that's the question, right? There just isn't a lot of transparency over where this data is going. U.S. officials that I talked to are very concerned about it. They say that there isn't a lot of regulation about what these companies can do with your data. And they also say that China has a strategy of gathering medical data. It isn't just about bioweapons. It's also a national strategy that they think will benefit them because biological data is going to be the new oil. It's like a gold rush. There's a lot of products they can make with 
bioengineering, if they get if they corner the market on data, and they're doing it by buying data, they're also doing it by hacking uh, American companies, and they're building huge databases of it. This is what U.S. officials have been warning of for some time. Tom. All right, Ken Delaney and first. Ken, thanks for breaking that down for us. I know it's pretty complex. We're going to have to wait and see what happens there. All right, we want to turn out to the economy, and this week could set the scene for the coming months. We could learn if we're, in fact, on the edge of a recession. This is the Fed is set to act again, raising interest rates to combat inflation, which is hitting everyone. Tom Costello has more. In Washington and across the country, high stakes over four decade high inflation, up 9% year over year. In Illinois, mother of three and special ed teacher Ali Alvarado says it's taking a financial and emotional toll. Clothing up 5%, gas up nearly 60%, food prices up 10.5%, forcing them to cut back. And now it's back to kind of paycheck to paycheck and watching to make sure we're not going into overdraft. At a food bank in Loudoun County, Virginia, so many families are asking for help. They ran out of food after 90 minutes today. We are seeing 20 to 25 new families each week that are coming in that are new to us, that have never gotten our services before. Meanwhile, a new AAA poll finds 88% of those asked are cutting back on driving due to higher gas prices. While prices have recently dropped, they're still averaging 436 a gallon nationwide. All of it adding pressure on the Fed expected to raise interest rates another three quarters of a percentage point this week, just as second quarter GDP numbers could signal at the economy economy shrank for two quarters in a row, a common definition for a recession. But Americans are still spending and employers are still hiring. President Biden says a recession is not a done deal. God willing, I don't think we're going to see a recession. All right, we thank Tom Costello for that one. Now time for our Global Watch, the deadly shooting spree in Canada. At least two people were killed and two others seriously hurt at several different locations in Langley, British Columbia, near the U.S. border. Police also fatally shot the suspect, who they say was targeting homeless people. And a massive sandstorm trapped hundreds of people in northwest China. New video shows a giant wall of sand and dust consuming a roadway and turning the sky yellow. This happened in the Qinghai province. Officials say the storm lasted up to four hours with little to no visibility in some areas. Luckily, no serious injuries were reported. And a 14-year-old rescued off the coast of Spain thanks to a drone. This is incredible. Video from the lifeguard drone showing it dropping a life vest to the young teenager who was caught in a powerful tide in Valencia, riptide, the device allowing the swimmer to stay afloat until a lifeguard team was able to get there. The team was hospitalized but is expected to be okay. Drones have been working with lifeguards at 22 beaches across Spain. Pretty impressive. But more than a decade later, she'll be setting fire to a different stage after announcing the new dates for her Las Vegas residency, Weekends with Adele. You may remember back in January, the Grammy-winning artist postponed the set of shows just one day before it was set to begin. Many fans had already traveled to see her and instead were met with this message. I'm so upset and I'm really embarrassed and I'm so sorry to everyone that's traveled again. I'm really, really sorry. I'm really sorry. Adele adding that because so many on her team had gotten COVID, they just weren't ready. But now she's promising the residency will begin November 18th and run through March at Caesars Palace. I want to bring in Variety Deputy Music Editor Jim Aswa to walk us through. Jim, you wrote about this for Variety today. So the big question is, she canceled the day before last time. What makes you believe she's going to perform this time? Uh, last time, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, things, canceling again would be really hard to recover from career wise. Now, in the past, she has canceled shows because of throat ailments, because of illness, whatever. That's understandable. But as we understand it, she, this was postponed because she didn't like the show. The COVID thing they sort of backed off from. Really? Yeah. OK, so what can happen to the people who had tickets last time? Will they get any sort of preferential treatment this time around? Yes, they get they get first dibs on tickets um, in uh, Adele FaceTimed a lot of fans right after the cancellation and she promised them drink tickets. So there's that. Um, okay. But yes, they get first choices. The the ticket availability is so confusing and so complicated. All I can say is there's a bunch of deadlines coming in August. Yeah, right, 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 right. So I want to I want to post something. I want to show you something that that Adele posted on Instagram. She wrote, now I know for some it was a horrible decision on my part. I will always be sorry for that, but I promise it was the right one. I, I got to ask you, how do you think this has impacted her legacy or is it do we live in a time now where these things are forgotten and fans will move on? Uh, it's a little bit of both, quite honestly, because it is 
if what we heard happened is true. She hadn't really looked at the show. She got there a couple of days before, decided it was totally unacceptable, and bailed. That is the ultimate diva move, okay? That is inexcusable to fans who had traveled from all over the world to be there, spent heaven knows how much money, and all of a sudden, sorry, it's not ready, okay? She somehow recovered from that. I'm not quite sure. It was a combination of both engaging with it and not engaging with it and being quiet for a good number of months. She put on two stellar performances in London's Hyde Park earlier this month. So that put some wind in her sails. And uh, now it's rescheduled. And fans were forgiving her almost immediately. I think the tears probably didn't hurt. Um, but, you know, I mean, if I were a fan, I would have been absolutely livid. I wouldn't have come back. So Adele has this incredible voice. She's, she's put out some of the best albums, I would say, of, of the last decade. Um, she has sort of this minor blip, if you will. It's obviously affecting fans. But Americans do love a comeback story. And I just wonder with this residency, you know, once the social clips get out, like how much it could boost her profile and sort of get Adele back sort of in, in, in the name. Because we were talking earlier that that new album kind of came and went. Yeah, that is the case with most albums these days. It'll be interesting to see how long Beyonce's album, which is coming out on Friday, stays in the spotlight. Um, because the best they've gotten is two weeks. Unless you've got something like a TV show, a tour, something like that. Like or a great show. album like Lizzo's album. I think that there album. I think that album's going to hold for, for at least a few months. Well, we'll see. It's not yeah. doing great on the charts, yeah, to be I honest heard. with you. Even though there's a lot of there's a lot of attention around it. The one who's the exception to that rule lately has been Harry Styles, and he's done that by not only by just being Harry Styles, but yeah. by being on tour constantly. He's barely been off the road for the past year. Slightly less than yeah. a year. So, but also a great album. He can't miss either with fans. Fans yeah. love him. He destroyed the Today Show. I mean, yeah. they, they were lined up for hours and uh, enjoyed that performance. Uh, Jim, always great to have you on. Thanks so much for coming. We love Variety. My when pleasure. we come back, pitching in the baseball team here in New York City, hoping to find a way to help those affected by the war in Ukraine. Their efforts bringing them all the way to Poland. That incredible story. Next. Finally tonight, stepping up to the plate for service. One New York baseball organization finding a new purpose, sharing America's pastime with Ukrainian refugee children, what they found and what they shared in their journey from Central Park to Poland. At New York Empire Baseball on the Upper West Side, Coach Jordan Baltimore has one message for his young players, focus on the process. What makes baseball difficult and such a perfect metaphor for life is that Good process will bring good outcome over time, and you cannot control the outcomes. The only thing you can control is the process. But when the war in Ukraine started... Quite frankly, I felt helpless. This wasn't a war. This was people dying in cities and an entire country getting leveled and people with nothing. And we immediately mobilized and said, let's start donating to orphanages and hospitals that were on the ground. Baltimore and his players felt they could offer something more to the kids impacted by war. Because our culture is very, very special around empowering children from a very young age. So through a partnership with the nonprofit SOK Foundation, Baltimore and a team of six of his players traveled to Poland, sharing their love of baseball with displaced Ukrainian refugees. Well, at first I was a little skeptical because what, like, I wasn't sure like how much help it would be um, coaching refugees. While focused on baseball, Empire's trip went beyond the nine-inning game. On their first day in Poland... We went to this orphanage where we cooked, cleaned, sorted shoes, and just helped out around the orphanage and did their daily chores that the kids would usually have to do on a daily basis. Then they hit the field, teaching a brand new game to these children, all while working through a language barrier. What, what helped a lot was nonverbal communication, like a lot of pointing and a lot of, like a lot of hand movements. In fact, it was probably better off because they were able to just see what needed to be done and go have fun with it. Uh, so it was terrific. There were no sort of preconceived notions or, or fears. Beyond just balls and strikes, coach and empire player David Rosen says he saw himself in the way these kids were playing the game. It was just incredible to see the smiles on their faces and how they really just wanted to play and just wanted to get out on the field and do everything that I wanted to do when I was younger at their age. Coach Jordan and the American players hoping to leave these Ukrainian children with more than just the game of baseball. It was truly amazing to 
see what we do here and and connect with these kids who are going through such a tough time in their life to be able to connect with them and make them smile it was it was incredible a great effort. We thank you so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.